How worried should I be about inflation as a retail investor? This is Trillion's ETF Master Chef, where we interview the chefs of the finance world on their hottest investment recipes. If you're an investor that really believes in investing for the future, that can handle or withstand some of the volatility that can come, then yeah, it could be used as a core holding. You have athletes and you have influencers as clients. I'd assume they're into crypto. Are you getting them exposure? We're absolutely overlaying it on the portfolio. What's your favorite ticker? It's the best ticker ever. It really kind of captures the themes. What you're trying to always deliver is a very simple solution. And if you can deliver that simple solution powerfully, I think that resonates quite well in the market. Tell us about this portfolio. Where's that spice gonna come from? We're looking for portfolios that have less risk than the market, but that perform better. You are building a portfolio. It's much like you know cooking a meal. And ETFs, I just think, make investing just so convenient and easy. Trillions ETF Master Chef, only on Quick Take. Coming up on Quick Take. I don't think you can overstate the online communities or social media's influence on financial markets. Let's just lock it on up and take fifteen thousand dollars. Here's a stock that can change your life. I see a stock going up and I buy it and I just watch it until it stops going up and then I sell it. I have gained over $3 million. I want some free money. The revolutionaries on Reddit are spanking Wall Street's ass. The more these stocks go up, the more the big guys are getting creamed and losing billions of dollars. This isn't a wealthy person's game anymore. Anyone can play it. I took up a little bit of a new hobby and I am interested in day trading. From brokerage apps to Discord channels and subreddits to TikTok finfluencers, one of the last holdouts in the world of disruption, finance, is next in line. All this and more on Quick Take. The pandemic has affected everyone in different ways. I'm Scarlett Fu. This is Bloomberg Quick Take. A growing number of tennis players and officials are asking, where in the world is Peng Shuai? The Chinese tennis star has not been seen publicly since detailing a turbulent, decade-long relationship with a retired Communist Party official. She took to social media this month, accusing former Vice Premier Zhang Gaoli of coercing her into sex three years ago. Peng's post was deleted around 30 minutes after it was published, and she has not been seen or heard from since. So why is this significant and what happens now? I want to bring in Chris Fenton. He's a former Hollywood film producer and author of Feeding the Dragon, Inside the Trillion Dollar Dilemma Facing Hollywood, the NBA, and American Business. Chris, it is always good to speak with you. Welcome back to Quick Take. Um, clearly, this story is raising a lot of concerns around the world. You've got tennis stars like Naomi Osaka tweeting about it, uh, saying things like, I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but I do want to point out that uh, this superstar tennis player from China is perhaps uh, in danger. Censorship is never okay at any cost, she writes. I hope Peng Shui and her family are safe and okay. I'm in shock of the current situation. I'm sending love and light her way. The World Tennis Association has even come out and talked about it. The CEO and chairman, Steve Simon, urging an investigation into Peng's whereabouts. He even told the New York Times, Chris, that maybe the WTA might reconsider its operations in China if they don't get a sufficient response. What do you make of that? Does, does the World Tennis Association have that kind of leverage in China? Well, first of all, there's a, a confluence of events here that's quite remarkable, right? You have Enos Cantor and the NBA once again entangled in a big geopolitical issue with China, um, with his essentially remarks he's making that are critical of the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Then on top of it, you have the Beijing Olympics right around the corner, less than 100 days from now in February. And then this incredible controversy, which is actually creating a lot of dialogue among uh, experts, way more expert than me, as to exactly what's going on. Because you did mention that her post was up for 30 minutes. And the question is whether this is one of those kill the chicken to scare the monkey moments, which is using a Chinese proverb, in the way that Xi Jinping might actually be trying to eradicate a rival, or whether it is actually something much more straightforward. So what do you make of the timing of her accusation and her seeming disappearance from public life? I mean, you mentioned Ennis Cantor and the NBA. He, of course, is the basketball player, the NBA player, who had tweeted out his support of Tibet, free Tibet, and, and basically slammed Chinese Premier Xi Jinping, earning the wrath of Chinese government officials. 
Well, first of all, you just had the Six Plenum, which is a huge event for the Chinese Communist Party and the Central Committee. Um, you also have the ranking of, of John Galli, who um, up until 2018 was a standing committee member. There's only seven of them out of the 92 million Communist Party members. So this is a hugely high profile scandal, if it indeed is that. So the timing of it could be Xi Jinping really trying to eradicate rivals, or on the other hand, something that came out that seems very nefarious by an ally of his and something that he wants to cover up as quickly as possible. And that might be why we've noticed this disappearance happen. And I fear for what's going on with Peng uh, as far as her health and um, welfare right now. Does the fact that you have people like Naomi Osaka and even uh, Novak Djokovic talking about this change her fate in any way or how China will deal with her? Well, first of all, as we've seen with the two Michaels in Canada, um, the, the the two Canadians that were held captive in China for so long, that if there is a groundswell of support and momentum by people who are outspoken about uh, a disappearance or a false imprisonment, that can lead to some sort of a solution. I think it's very interesting to see tennis players who have a lot at stake when it comes to sponsorships and endorsements and even appearances in China come out in, in involved and being very very activist in this role. We haven't seen that a lot by athletes, mainly because the money is so big in that market. So that could build momentum, not only to change, um, hopefully, Peng's welfare into something that has a happy ending, but on top of it, change the dynamic of us going into the Beijing Olympics in February. Yeah, and I want to get to that shortly. But but first, I know that you were busy earlier today. You were actually um, speaking on this topic on national security and sports in China, uh, lecturing to the National War College in Washington, D.C. about this. This is something that you do every semester for a course on soft power and influence there. Um, what do we need to know about China's specific approach to national security and sports that will help us understand how to frame this current conversation? Well, it's fascinating. I mean, Captain Corey Ray um, runs that particular class down there at the War College, and it's fascinating. And in fact, looks at um, the history of the Pentagon and Department of Defense's use of narrative around the world to achieve certain goals through soft power influence. But now it's really turned its attention towards China and the way that China approaches cross-border censorship and cross-border propaganda methods in order to spread the messages that they want the rest of the world to hear and adhere to. So we're seeing that just in, in terms of the pernicious uh, behavior in, tar, uh, in regards to censoring the way we can criticize them. But then on top of it, the way they are mandating certain actions by corporations to designate um, nine dash line borders or to actually dictate that Taiwan can't be seen as a separate nation on maps for airlines or uh, what have you. So it's a really interesting dynamic that's going on now where China is really using soft power influence to create much animosity around the world and really influence people um, into thinking the way they want them to think. And how do Chinese celebrities like tennis star Peng Shui or actors or musicians or anyone else fit into that soft power? Well, remember, I mean, the followings of somebody like Peng, I believe she had 20 million Weibo followers, is really powerful. So when she comes out and makes a statement like that, obviously inside China's borders, it makes a real, real momentum move where, as we saw after 30 minutes, that was taken down and some severe steps were taken on, on the backs of that. But then on top of it, the influence of these celebrities around the world and how quickly that gets picked up on social media platforms worldwide is really remarkable. And it's something that the Chinese government both wants to curb when it's in terms of criticism towards actions and policies that they have, but it's also ones that they use to amplify in terms of getting offensive directives out in narrative. Right, right. They'll use it as it suits them best. I want to go to what you were talking about, which is the Beijing Olympics. It's due to take place next year, early next year in Beijing. Um, and 
We had mentioned before that China is going to field an ice hockey team, or ice and ice hockey team, whatever the verb is in this case, but it may not be able to do so because they don't have enough homegrown talent. So there is, there are a couple of Chinese professional hockey teams. Uh, one of them is the Quinlan Red Star, and most of the players are Canadian. And there's now questions over whether China will be able to put together this team and compete in the games, which technically, my understanding is that in the past it should have been able to because it is going to be the host, right? Yeah, well, what's fascinating with this particular Olympics is, is the Winter Olympics, and China is not particularly good at a lot of those sports. So they're not going to have the medal count to be able to amplify their image around the world. Really, these Olympics are about showcasing China in its adulthood stage as the new rival superpower and the new regional power. power. So they're really trying to use it to showcase infrastructure, the glory and majesty of the nation, and the competence of the government there. Um, and in fact, most most of that is going to be televised rather than seen in person, because remember, only really the athletes and the Chinese nationals can actually see and attend these events. So it's going to be very interesting. So something like the Chinese hockey team, if they can't compete at a level that's less than embarrassing, it becomes a real problem for face with them. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And on top of that, that's happening at the same point where Josh Rogan of Washington Post yesterday broke the story of a possible diplomatic boycott by the United States in regards to those Olympics. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more, because that's not the first time this has been brought up. But so far, we've just kind of gotten whisperings of that. There is no indication so far among Olympians or uh, aspiring Olympians that this is necessarily going to happen. Where is this coming from, this idea that there might be a diplomatic boycott? Is this something, for instance, the White House is seriously considering it? Or is this just something that people are, are saying should be considered? Well, I'm not an investigative reporter like like uh, Josh Rogan, but he tends to have pretty good sources. But I will say the momentum for this started to build, I think, when Senator Mitt Romney first brought up the idea. And it's an idea that's been used in the past. And it's actually one that's sort of an interesting uh, way to allow athletes to go perform and to compete at the level that they have been training at for so long and sacrificing so much for, yet not validating the Chinese government during a time when there are so many issues that we have with them, not just our country, but most of the West, and include, include into that a lot of their regional players. So to validate them by allowing them the full scope of what they want to showcase is not probably the right thing to do. So a diplomatic boycott allows sort of a have your cake and eat mm. it to issue. Got it, got it. What might be the catalyst to actually go through with that diplomatic boycott? What Do you think it might be linked to Peng Shui, for instance, if, if there is no resolution there? What, what would be the catalyst? Well, it's interesting. A lot of the a lot of the um, opponents to boycotting are obviously the athletes who have dedicated their life and so much to competing in these Olympics. But if athletes start to get behind her disappearance and demand answers and demand her set free or whatever her situation is, that could create a groundswell among other athletes because athletes tend to have a lot of brethren solidarity among them because they go through so many similar um, capacities as they train. So it'll be interesting to see how athletes um, support this and how they move forward with the Olympics. But I would say at the same time, we definitely see a lot of tense issues between the two countries and the rest of the West diplomatically. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if we actually take this diplomatic boycott to heart. Got it, got it. And we'll be looking to see if anything like that does happen. Chris, you've spent years um, selling U.S. sports, namely basketball and U.S. movies to a Chinese market. So you've seen the compromises that businesses and leaders are willing to make in order to preserve access to the potential of the Chinese market. What mistakes do you think American sports leagues, American businesses, American executives consistently make when it comes to China? Well, there's the mistake, if you're looking on a capitalistic basis, I mean, the mistakes aren't aren't really there. They're actually doing a lot of the right things in order to protect the fiduciary responsibilities of growing the value of these different entities and generating new revenues from that huge market. Where I think the problem is, is the fact that we have been um, 
over kowtowing, we have actually been really selling the soul and the values and the principles of what makes America what we are today and what was really the foundation of capitalism to begin with in order to gain access to that market. So the long-term health of America and the West, our Western allies, and sort of the health of capitalism overall is being compromised on, on the backs of short-term gains. So I think we really need to start thinking of a, more of a patriotic uh, version of a first agenda item before we embark on capitalism in order to protect what's important to America. But yet, we don't want to decouple from China. There is a great market there. There's a lot of value in having commercial and cultural exchange with our rival superpower. And quite frankly, it will keep us from staying away from a war, which none of us want. Yeah, who's the leader to to help us lead that to, to lead the reassessment of this dynamic that we have with China? I mean, is it the federal government? Is it an industry? Is it a particular executive? Well, I think it's going to take some big, big names to take on that Muhammad Ali effect of both being world class in whatever their sport or discipline is, and then taking on an activism role. I would argue in the NBA, it's a LeBron James. I would say in Hollywood, you have somebody like a John Cena. You could have corporate, um, you know, sort of titans like a Phil Knight and Elon Musk get involved, but you have to have the government back it too. We have to say to these corporations that if there is retaliation, you have have the government backing you to prevent that from happening and also help rally other partners to back these companies when they take these stands. Because the last thing you want is Nike to take a stand and then suddenly Adidas slides right into mm -hmm. their market share. Right, right? right. You need to have a united stand. Okay. It's interesting because you mentioned LeBron, you mentioned Elon Musk, you mentioned John Cena. These are all three uh, people who are very much have high profiles who have basically kowtowed to China. I mean, they've, if anything, bent over backwards to make clear that, you know, they were not on the same page with those who have criticized China. So, and China knows this too. Beijing knows this full, full and well. So are they really going to turn around and say, you know what, let's lead an effort to, to resist a little bit and to, to take stock of what we need to prioritize here? Well, look, I would never call out any of these people and say, you need to do this because they have so much skin in the game, right? But what's going to happen is that skin in the game, the risk reward calculus is going to change because there's more of an awareness of this kowtowing and pandering we were doing to the with the Chinese government in order to gain access to that market that consumers are starting to have a problem with. Journalists are having an issue with it. Politicians are having an issue with it. So we're going to start to see consumers rebel against some of these entities as they continue that course. At the same time, we're seeing imitators in the China market, particularly in Hollywood, which has seen market share drop precipitously over the last decade. That market share is getting taken away by an imitator. So the reward of doing what we have been doing to get into China is becoming minimalized. And the risk of losing consumers in the West over this continuous, uh, continuing this engagement the way it has been might start to gain momentum. And that is what's going to be the tipping point. Gotcha, gotcha. Chris, thank you so much. Chris Fenton, of course, joining us here. He is author of The Feeding Dragon. Really appreciate your thoughts.